what we're going to talk about is a little bit of a history of employee stock ownership plans. And when people hear that acronym ESOPs, there's a lot of uh, disconnect and misnomers and misunderstandings. So I want to start with the history. I'm going to talk about what ESOPs actually are. I'll go through some of the area ESOP companies, some from Massachusetts, some from uh, New Hampshire, and some from Maine. And you'd be surprised some of the ones that are on the list. Uh, we'll talk about the tax benefits. Uh, ESOPs truly are a wonderful tax benefit. Uh, and it's one of those tax benefits that are um, not necessarily uh, always talked about or understood. And we'll also talk about how an ESOP is created and how everybody to a certain degree in this group does fit in to that entire ESOP uh, team. And of course, at the end, we will uh, summarize and, and answer any questions. First and foremost, on presenting this, this is from a book called Private Capital Markets. And the writer, the author of the book is Robert Slee. He's actually known as the godfather to the private capital markets. Uh, he was the one that really put together an understanding of how business, private businesses are valued, how they sell, what the M&A people really need to look at. And he put together this wonderful table that shows that depending on the motivation of shareholders and depending on what's motivating them to transfer, and I'm just gonna pardon myself for a minute. If everybody can put yourselves on mute because I'm getting some background noise from someone, that would be terrific. Great, thank you. Um, depending on that transfer motivation, there's gonna be a channel that everybody's going to pick. And of course, on the right-hand side, we have companies that go public. Okay, that's one way that business owners transition or transfer their or commoditize their, 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 uh, their business and the value of their business. On the other side of the coin is selling to employees. Of course, today we're going to talk about ESOPs, but there are other various ways that you can sell to employees, such as management buyouts, management buy-ins, offering options, phantom SARS, etc., and then there's a whole slew of other types of transfer channels and transfer methods that are out there. Quick history about ESOPs. The first ESOP was actually created in 1957. In 1974, ERISA, uh, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act was passed by Congress and it helped define the retirement market, including the ESOP market. And they went dormant between 1974 and 1984. Not many companies were using them, or at least there were only public companies that had exposure to ESOPs, but they didn't really understand how to use them. And then something interesting happened in 1984. In 1984, National Steel looked at their divisions, and there was a division that they had called Wharton Steel, and they decided to close, close the shop down. Employees said, not so fast. What can we do? How can we get together and buy out the company? And in 1984, Wharton Steel was sold to the employees through this proverbial name called, or acronym called ESOP. Between the 80s and 90s, they were primarily used by public companies as a hostile takeover defense. If you have ever seen the movie Wall Street, the first movie, if you remember Michael Douglas, He's standing up there and talking to the board and, and talking to the employees, and he's going to be buying out the company and then slashing the pension plan and really, you know, um, profiting from that. And the employee said, not so fast. And there's a line in there where the head of the employees comes to, the, comes to uh, uh, Michael Douglas and says, you know, if worse comes to worse, we will get together, we as the employees, and buy out the company. Okay. And again, that was an ESOP that they were talking about. But then in 1996, something huge happened for the ESOP market. And in 96, the Small Business Job Protection Act actually amended S corporations and allowed for S corporations to actually be owned by, by, by entities rather than just a natural person. So you could actually now hold an S corporation share inside a trust and hence the ESOP market took a look at it and said, why can't we, for small private businesses, and most private businesses are S corporations, why can't we now utilize the ESOP method as a way for business owners to sell to their employees? And from 1996, the ESOP market took off. 
common misnomers about ESOPs, and I've heard it all the time. I mean, when I first bring up the acronym, I hear it, I hear the same things. Well, the employees can't afford to buy me. That's a misnomer. The employees aren't buying you per se. I'm not going to have the employees telling me what to do. Well, the employees don't take control of the company necessarily. ESOPs are complicated and costly to set up. Sure. Anything that involves attorneys is complicated, right? And costly. Going through an M&A transaction is complicated and costly as well. And in fact, probably costlier than going through an ESOP. I'm not planning on leaving my company right away. That's a huge misnomer. An ESOP does not need to be implemented only at the time that a shareholder believes or wants to exit their business. In fact, it could be set up years in advance for various other reasons that we'll talk about in a minute. Private equity will pay me more and take care of me and my employees better. Well, the first part might be true up to a certain point, but you can mirror the value, especially when you consider all the tax considerations and tax savings of an ESOP. You can kind of mirror the private equity valuation up to a certain point. More importantly, take care of me and my employees better. I'll leave it to you to think about companies that you deal with as a consumer that have sold to private equity and what eventually could happen, not every experience, but could happen to employees and to the company overall. So what's an ESOP? Okay, plainly and simply speaking, it is a benefit for everybody. For a business owner, it's an instant market. It's a ready market for selling the company because they're selling it to the business. The business is using its own profits to purchase the shares and purchase the shareholder, uh, shareholders' uh, sh uh, shares and ownership. For employees, it's actually a company-funded retirement plan. It's on top of any other company-funded retirement plan that they may have, such as a 401k plan, such as a profit-sharing plan. For the company, it's a business finance and tax, tax technique. It's a performance incentive program as well. Because if you think about it, when all of a sudden your employees are on the same side of the table as the shareholders, as the, as the original shareholders or owners, it starts to change the culture of what goes on in a company. And there are plenty of examples of a profound improvement in the culture and performance of companies that have gone the ESOP direction. For the feds, well, it's a tax incentive. Yeah, they're giving us a tax incentive and it's still a tax incentive. And that's irrespective of whether a Democratic administration or a Republican administration controls Congress or the, uh, the White House because it encourages wealth distribution. It is really a wealth distribution tool. And that's the way the federal government looks at it. For the community, it's a huge job preservation technique. You don't have a buyer that's going to come in and slash jobs, slash positions. In fact, the, that's part of the benefit of selling to an ESOP. You're preserving everybody's job. In other words, it's a net long-term benefit for everybody. Stated differently, it's a tax advantage way to transition the ownership. It's a way, it's a tool to help align employee goals with company goals and to absolutely impact in a positive way the culture of a company. For employees, it's more money in the retirement account, but it's a, it's a retirement account that's valued based on the value of their company, what they're uh, bleeding and sweating and pouring over and, and, and helping grow as opposed to some, um, some stock or bond or mutual fund that's inside of their other 401 or other retirement plan or their 401k plan. For the business, it's a benefit for higher cash flows that result from potential tax savings to the company. And of course, that cultural shift. It is in essence a very, very good balance be, between everybody's objectives and goals as an employee, as an owner, as a business. It is a phenomenal balance. And that's what we've seen with, with ESOPs that we've implemented across New England. Who are some of the companies or the industries that are out there? Well, looking at it nationally, and this is information from 2018, about 
22% of the ESOPs that are out there are in the manufacturing sector. Interestingly enough, the next most uh, popular sector, if you will, at 19% are professional organizations and science and technology services, engineering, things of that nature. And then there comes finance, insurance, and real estate. There's a significant amount of large registered investment advisories, large insurance brokerage houses that have gone ESOP, followed by construction. Construction companies are a prime candidate for an ESOP type of a setup, followed by everybody else that you see here on this, uh, on this slide. How many workers are in ESOPs? Well, there are about 5,783 as of 2018, 5,783 plans out there. Most important thing that I want you to keep in mind that about a little more than 60% of them or about 60% of them are small plans. They are companies that have participants of under 100 employees. Many people think that you have to have a very large company in order to consider an ESOP. Fact is, Sweet spots for ESOPs are at about 30 to 40 employees because of the effect that it has on culture. Now, that's not to say that large companies don't participate in ESOPs. There's about 2,400 ESOPs out there uh, in the private market sector that have 100 or more employees. When we talk about an ESOP in a public market, the reasons to implement an ESOP in a publicly traded company are entirely different than the reasons to implement an ESOP in the private market sector. So this only references the private market sector, not ESOPs that you may see with publicly traded companies, okay? Some of the ESOP companies in Massachusetts, well, there's about 109, again, as of 20, uh, 2018, there were 109 privately held ESOP companies, okay? Headquartered across 80 or more communities covering about 22,000 participants with 15,000 current employees. The difference in number being people who have probably either left and left their money in the ESOP plan or have retired. And that's about $2 billion in total plan assets. For the financial advisors in the group, that's a huge amount of money that is in these retirement plans with participants who at some point will retire and or transition off and might be looking to roll over their money, roll over into an, into an IRA. Some of the companies that are out there, Cape Air, if you've ever taken Cape Air to Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard, they're an employee owned company. Okay, Mass, Brew, Mass Bay Brewing Company, all right? Um, a whole slew of different companies that are out in Massachusetts. If you ever look over and you see a truck and it says employee owned or, um, you know, ESOP or EO owned, that means that they are an employee owned company, either 100% or partially uh, as an ESOP company. New Hampshire has about 31 uh, privately held ESOP companies at this time, okay? Some of the companies that are ESOPs here in New Hampshire, I'm sitting in Portsmouth right now, are Hypertherm, uh, Poultry Products Northeast, New England Wire Technologies, McDevitt Trucks. If you live in New Hampshire, I'm sure you've seen a truck of theirs of one of these companies out there. In Maine, about 59 privately held ESOPs. Um, I will tell you there's actually 64, three of which I'm proud to say I've helped implement uh, in Maine. Um, there's 64 as of this year, 59 as of 20, uh, 2018. Some of the companies up in Maine that are familiar to people that are in Maine, Moody's Collision, okay? Moody's Collision is an auto body shop and uh, uh, Sean Moody has done a wonderful job in cultivating the culture in, in his company and growing the company, all due to the fact that he did go ESOP. He commoditized the value initially with a small amount. He saw the effect that it had on that small amount of shares that he sold back into the ESOP. And now he's, um, I believe he's a 90% ESOP owned company at this point. Uh, Johnny Selected Seeds, Sargent Corporation, Harpoon Brewery, they're out of Vermont. They're a huge ESOP company. Another company out of Vermont is um, King Arthur's Baking. If you know and are familiar with King Arthur's Baking products, they're another ESOP company out there. 
Let me shift gears a little bit, get a little technical, but not too much. What are the tax benefits of ESOPs? Now, again, we're talking private companies, not necessarily publicly traded companies. And of course, when we see C corporation, we think publicly traded companies because publicly traded companies are only C corporations. But for a private C corporation, there are some tax benefits. First and foremost, for an exiting shareholder, if they sell at least 30% of the value of their shares back into an ESOP, in other words, they retain 70% ownership, and you can do that, but if they do sell at least 30% and they reinvest in what is considered qualified replacement property, which is simply a basket of U.S. companies, U.S. company stock and, and corporate debt, okay? They have to be U.S.-based then the share, selling shareholder gets to defer all capital gains from that amount until the assets are sold. It's known as a 1042 deferred capital gains uh, from section 1042 in the IRS code. They do not pay capital gains unless they liquidate their asset, they liquidate the, the, the principal in some way, shape or form. If they're living off of the dividend that that qualified replacement property is is creating, then they're only taxed on the dividend. They do not get taxed capital gains until they liquidate and cash in any part of the principal that came from the ESOP sale. Of course, at death, at least under current law, they'll receive a step up in basis. So nobody pays the tax on the fact that they sold those shares if they do a 1042 uh, cap deferred capital gains exchange. For the, corpor for the corporation, for the company, they get some benefits themselves. They get to basically, you know, leverage transaction, write off both principal and interest if a loan was used to buy the shares. Principal and interest payments that are made to pay off the loan that was used to buy the shares become tax deductible, okay? Any contributions that are going into the ESOP trust that now has bought the shares become tax deductible for the company. And any contributions of other stock that is made into the ESOP trust becomes tax deductible for the C corporation. For an S corporation, currently under current law, a selling shareholder does not get to take advantage of 1042. There are provisions right now that are sitting in Congress. They've been sitting there for about four years and we know how Congress works. It's been sitting there to, to allow S corporation selling shareholders to, to have the 1042 deferred capital gain provision apply to them as well. It is expected at some point for it to pass. It just hasn't as of yet. But in addition to what might pass, these are the current benefits that an S corporation gets in terms of selling or becoming uh, a, an ESOP company. No taxes are due on distributions of portion of earnings attributable to the shares owned by the ESOP. For example, if you're a 100% ESOP owned S corporation, you pay no federal income taxes on any of the profits that are generated by your company. And in many states, states have adopted the exact same, um, sorry, I just saw a chat there. Um, they've adopted the exact same provision where there are no state income taxes that are due to the profits of that S corporation. If you are a 50% ESOP owned company, then 50% of the profits are considered tax free there is no tax that is paid on the 50% of those profits, with the other 50%, of course, going to the, to the shareholder that still owns 50% of the company. Let me give you an example of an S corporation and its benefits. Let's assume that the taxable profits of the company was $2.5 million. And it's an S corporation. Naturally, it's considered a flow through. So that $2.5 million profit shows up on the shareholders tax return. Well, at 37% federal income tax, only federal, only looking at the federal side, they're going to have to pay $925,000 tax on that dividend. 
Now that doesn't consider section 199A and the 20% reduction and blah, blah, blah from the most recent tax act of 2017. Let's just assume that the tax dividend or the, div the tax on the dividend is $925,000. If we were a 50% S corporation, uh, excuse me, 50% ESOP owned S corporation, that means the ESOP trust owns 50% of the, of the shares that are then distributed to the employees and the remaining shareholders own the remaining 50%. They own the other half. Well, only half of that income or, or the, the profits would be taxed to the employee. So that we see that there's $462,500 tax that's due with the other 462,500 going back to the ESOP. Now you may say from a cash flow perspective, it still has to be paid. It's only paid to the ESOP. That is correct. But the ESOP is going to have certain expenses that last annually. And the ESOP is going to have to accrue money in the future to buy back shares from either departing employees or retiring employees. If we were a 100% ESOP owned S corporation, there'd be no tax that's due on the dividend or the profits, those profits would remain in the company and in the ESOP and the trust. So for both C and S corporation, from an employee standpoint, what's the benefit? They pay nothing out of pocket for an additional retirement plan. There's no tax on the stock that's allocated to their ESOP until they receive distributions, either by way of retirement or leaving the company. And there's no tax on the distributions if they roll over that money to an IRA or a successor plan. Me? So how do you create an ESOP? All sounds well and good. How is that ESOP created? One of the things that we hear about is that it's costly, it's complicated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as I mentioned before, anything we do is going to be costly. It's going to be complicated unless you're, act, you're, you're working with people that know what they're doing. The very first step in creating an ESOP is having someone conduct a feasibility study. That's what we do. We do a feasibility study. It determines the viability, the financial strength of the company on taking on an ESOP and the debt that they might take because the company borrows money. You know, for all the bankers in the group, they borrow money or the company borrows money to buy out the shareholders. Well, the company has to be financially stable. Not only does a company have to be financially stable, but for all the value growth people in the group, we want to have a culture that is prepared to take on quote unquote ownership. Now, let me digress for a minute. The employees don't actually have ownership of the company. I know we're talking about ESOP stock ownership plans. They are benefactors of the value of the company on a year by year basis. So in other words, whatever the company's valued at every year and the company has to be valued every year, okay? The value of their retirement plan, their ESOP retirement plan will reflect the value of the company. In that sense, they are benefactors. Are they owners? They own a certain percent, but they do not control the company. Again, they are just simply benefactors. They are not necessarily controllers of the company. Control can still remain with the selling shareholder and or the management team, again, talking to the value growth people, if they're prepared to take on that role. You do need a trustee, an outside firm, at least for the initial transaction that's going to act as the buyer of the shares they're going to conduct that arm's length purchase of the company and they're going to hire an appraiser. They're gonna to have to hire some of the values businesses and who has experience working with ESOPs because there are a lot of rules and regulations that have to be followed, okay? A plan document is going to be written by an ESOP attorney and that's really what the ESOP is, it's a trust. Think of it as your own personal trust, your, your living trust, your irrevocable trust, or a trust that you formed for your family. It's just simply a document of your wishes. It's nothing more. The ESOP is a document of the ESOP wishes following all rules and regulations. And then a plan summary 
uh, a summary plan description is created and it's given to the to the employees and they are enrolled much like they would be enrolled in a 401k plan. How does an ESOP get financed? Well, externally from a bank loan. You can take out a loan and there are banks that are out there. And again, talking to the bankers in the group that work with ESOP companies. An ESOP can also be transacted internally. If there's enough cash on a company's balance sheet, if there's enough profit every year, you can utilize the cash and or profit and do an internal ESOP sale. Or the owner could take back a seller's note from the company. So they literally are paid over a period of time. And again, a feasibility study can determine the best, either the best direction or combination of directions. Profit sharing, if the company has profit sharing, they can direct all the profits to funding and financing the ESOP as well, or a combination of any of the above. Again, who owns the company? The trust, the ESOP trust owns the company. The employees simply have a beneficial interest in the shares, they are benefactors. Of course, to them, from a cultural standpoint, it's very important that they increase their productivity and their efficiency and bottom line profit because that will reflect a higher value in their ESOP retirement plan. If the ESOP is leveraged, the trust holds the shares until the loan is paid and only releases the shares for the benefit of distributing among the employees as that loan is paid off. So in other words, you're really creating a carrot at the end of the stick for all employees to stick with the company long-term so that they can be apportioned a greater percentage of the ESOP trust shares to themselves. And employees are referred to as employee owners. Remember, an ESOP is a real transaction like any merger and acquisition. You hire a trustee because you negotiate with the trustee, and that's part of what we do. We negotiate what the price is going to be and what the terms of the transaction are going to be. The parties do need to be aligned either with the seller on a sell side or the buyer on a buy side. The trustee acts as a buyer and has fiduciary obligation to make sure that they are acting to the best interest of the ESOP, which means the employees eventually aren't overpaying. Now, they're not paying because they're not contributing, but it's they are, in a sense, paying because the profits of the company might drop. And the Department of Labor holds the trustee to a fiduciary standard. And that's where it gets a little tricky. You want to be working with people and trustees that know what they're doing. The advisors to the ESOP, there's administrators, there's accountants for the accountants in the group, bankers, attorneys, personal attorneys financial advisors that get involved. And of course, the trustee, and there are specific companies and specific entities that act as a trustee. The trustee is responsible for, for hiring the valuation company as it pertains to what they're going to pay for the, for the shares. But in the process of the feasibility study and the feasibility report, you want to do a valuation, which is part of what the feasibility uh, uh, study entails so that the shareholders get an idea of what they can expect in terms of value. So that first step is the feasibility study. It's going to give sellers, shareholders, the management information to determine the readiness, the company's readiness, their own readiness. Are they able to transition some authority, not all, but some authority into a culture that's, that, that's, that, that, that works together? It models the transaction for the company. It models the transaction financing. It models the valuation assessment. It considers the owner's full or partial exit and additional incentives such as warrants that are plugged into the plan so that the owner can continue to participate with the growth of the company in the future. And of course, the feasibility study considers repurchase obligations because at some point, the owners are going to, to leave, retire, or what have you, and there's going to be a buyback of those shares. Who's a good candidate company? Any company that's profitable and growing. You wouldn't go into an M&A transaction and expect a high value if you're not profitable and growing. If you're not profitable and growing and the feasibility study suggests that maybe you should work with a value growth advisor or, or do some more planning, 
You know, that, that, that's what the feasibility report is, is going to determine. Company that can, that can hold on to additional debt or can take on additional debt. A company that can finance growth. Company that has enough employees and payroll to spread the costs. The formula of determining the ESOPs model is based on their employees, on the company's employees and payroll. A company had, that has a corporate culture that's properly aligned. A lot of times we will suggest to a company, work with someone to align that culture. You're not yet ready. It's not going to be a successful ESOP if the culture isn't right and ready. And a strong management team and a bench that's available and, and ready to take over should the shareholder who eventually sells all his or her shares into the company, into the ESOP, decides to step away. Questions to consider with companies that you may work with. Well, do some or all shareholders want liquidity? Is selling to an insider or an outsider viable, attractive, and achievable? Will, the sell, will selling to an outsider expose the company? Quite often, and the m and people can speak to this as well, how much information gets, gets shared with a potential buyer, regardless of the fact that they may have an NDA in place, that potential buyer knows a lot about your company or about that target company, um, even if they don't go through the transaction at the end of the day. Is legacy important to the seller? And that's a very, very, it's a huge um, factor for a lot of the companies that we've dealt with. They've, they've wanted to retain that legacy. They wanted their company name to, to carry on. They didn't want changes. They didn't want to see their employees get downsized, if you will. If you sell to an outsider, what's the impact on jobs in the community? And what are the seller's personal, financial, and estate planning goals?